Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for, for joining us. I want to come to Yanni, first of all, because, Yanni, you, you actually were the trigger for so much of this coming to light. You found this going on in your own family. Tell us, tell us about that story. It started during lockdown. Um, we have four boys, and um, with the online learning, we were confronted with a change, quite a stark change in behavior in one of our sons. We noticed that he was withdrawing. He had become really angry. There was a, we could really see that he was under due stress. And the strange thing for us was that he was um, exerting a lot of the stress towards my wife, towards Sheree, which we found interesting. Um, we, we thought initially it was just lockdown and, you know, he's had enough and was wanting to go out and be with his friends. Um, and then we had a phone call from the school um, to say that he had accessed uh, some commercial pornographic websites um, on his school device. Um, when we opened up the conversation with him, it was two clicks away from doing his biology homework um, that had led him down this path. And um, fortunately, there were measures in place that picked it up quite quickly so we could deal with it as a family. But it did, um, it did launch us on a bit of a journey um, that, 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 we felt, oh gosh, uh, this is a really bad thing, but was there something that we could do to bring change in this area? So I think many families, if they'd had that experience, their instinct would be to put up a wall and to retreat and to keep it quiet and below the radar. Um, but you did something very courageous as a family. You actually decided to say, no, other families need to be aware of this too. How did you come to that decision as a family? I, uh, I, I remember sitting on the train um, back towards Epsom where we stay um, and reading a newspaper article in 2017 uh, about how age verification would be brought in for children. And I, I remember as a dad with four boys, this is such a good thing, I'm so excited about this. Um, and when this happened in our house, um, at that stage, Sheree, was walking around in the park with a friend, um, Gillian Conrath, um, and she shared some yeah. of the information <laughs> with Gillian, said this is where we find ourselves as a family, um, and we, we found ourselves in, actually in an ecosystem of hope. Um, and um, the, the church that I'm part of always speaks about spiritual renewal, you know, social renewal, cultural renewal, and when we'd come through the situation, having dealt with what was happening internally, we, we sat down as a family and asked ourselves the question, would we put our money where our mouth is in terms of these things? Would, if offered the opportunity to bring change, would we say yes to this? Um, a phone call later with Paul Conrath helped us realize and understand that we could do something, small part in our narrative, but it would be our moment in the story that we could help move this along. But the big moment for us, Philippa, was when we sat down with our son, mm. and we, um, we asked him about that. He was, uh, you know, obviously this, this could expose him. We, we recognized that this could end up in the national media, which it did. Um, we realized, he, though we never used his name or his age within the newspapers or the media, it, it, there was risk to him as a person. Um, and it came to a point where, after praying about this, we felt really strongly that we as a, as a family could do something about this. The key moment for, for us was when he said, yes, please let's try and turn this situation into something good. That, that's, I mean, it's a, a real courage on, on his part to do that. And uh, it, it speaks hugely to the culture of your family and the strength of your, of your family unit. Obviously, many children don't have that behind them. Uh, Vanessa, you have been campaigning ceaselessly on, on this subject. Um, can you talk us through some of the damage that, that can be done, that you've seen done to children through this? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, and I've, I've spoken a bit about this before. Um, that we, we now know that, that pornography uh, causes uh, neurological damage, particularly to children because their brains are still forming. Um, it, it causes a difference in their ability to concentrate. It causes great anxiety and other mental health issues. 
and uh, and physiological as well. You know, there's a there's been an, a huge rise in um, the in uh, erectile dysfunction in teenage boys, um, and that is it's having a kind of profound impact as well in terms of how boys and girls relate to each other. <coughs> Excuse me, that. Uh, you know, we know pornography is shaping sexual scripts, i.e. what people see is normal in sex. And the major themes of pornography are aggression and domination, predominantly of men over women. And this is now filtering down into our schools, our streets, our workplaces, our universities, um, uh, and into our homes. Um, mm. Because as James was saying, you know, this, this smartphone is, is part of this picture. Now, obviously, um, the three of you work together on bringing, bringing this about. But um, uh, this, I mean, it's quite, it's quite an interesting journey when you start working into a political and a parliamentary setting where you think change is just so obvious and that it just should happen. How did the journey and the ups and downs of it and the fact that, you know, at one point it didn't look as though James's amendment was going to go through. Uh, I remember you and I talking and me saying to you, Bless, I really don't think it's going to happen. Uh, but having to like really stand firm and say, no, we're going to keep pushing. How, how did that journey feel for you guys? I, um, so one of the things that is important to, to me and, and while I was leading CIS as well, um, something I tried to Im embed was that working together is absolutely essential. Sometimes it feels like it's going to be easier to just splinter off and you know, get the thing that you want. But we felt that at CIS, a big part of what we were there to do was to hold space, to bring together national children's charities, faith-based charities, uh, child safety experts, people who know about the age verification technology, and, and sort of hold a dynamic in which people can find a way forward together, um, and then weaving in and working closely with parliamentarians like, like James and Miriam and others. And, and that's... Uh, it's not it's not an easy path, um, but it felt it actually ultimately I do I don't think that we would have got to where we got to without being able to sort of uh, to commit to a journey together and, and working it through together. Yeah, and were there surprises for you along the way? I mean, like things that you thought like, oh, that's so easy, and then like, why is that so hard? There were quite a number of surprises. Um, <laughs> The one thing that I was very deeply surprised by, because uh, I did a number of radio interviews, and most of them were live, um, and I, uh, there were some of the radio stations that I thought initially was going to be a very difficult interview, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm expecting pushback, you know, who are you, and wh what are you trying to achieve, and not one of the interviews that I did, uh, Philippa, had any sense of resistance to it. As a matter of fact, I felt in most of the radio interviews, the announcer had done the job before I even came on air. And yet, on the other side, there was this issue of why did the government never enforce the Digital Economies Act Part 3? Um, uh, it, 2017, it had royal assent. Why was this never brought forward? And it, it, that was the mystery part for me that I felt there must be an agenda there somehow that's keeping this, having gone through Parliament, and then the fact that they initially kept that out of the online harms bill was just as surprising. Now you would, yeah, I was about to say, you'd know the agenda. <laughs> so so um, your words before we came up were very relevant for this. Yeah. We've been waiting for 30 years. It's been pretty obvious for 30 years since the internet began that we needed to address these issues. And there has just been a sort of um, reluctance to move the encampment, to, to get the animals moving and to, uh, and to actually commit to change. There's been a failure of imagination, a failure mm. of ambition, a failure of confidence. And I, I'm really confident would be the thing that I, yeah. that, that change is possible. Yeah. And you're right, they totally bottled it in 2017. It was all ready to go. The family was packed up, the car was ready, petrol was in the tank, and they just, they didn't leave home. They did that 40 years earlier in the desert as well, totally bottled it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I genuinely think that, you know, we are at the moment when the penny has dropped, that change is, and there's a lot of people simultaneously yeah. uh, feeling like change is imminent. And, I, I, and we must grasp that opportunity to shove like mad. I really, I really think this is the time. 
I think it's so helpful. I hope you're finding this conversation really helpful. This is about the journey of how you go on the pathway of transformation by collaborating with people, by being determined, as we heard from Kevin, by being prepared to walk uh, over time, by being creative, by building together. James, Vanessa, Yanni, can we say a huge thank you to you for everything you're doing? Really, really thank you.